lot easier to conform, and you can see how that can, can get confused with compliance. So compliance is responding yes to a direct request. A lot of compliance has to deal with authority. Okay, if I'm asked to do something, even if I don't want to do it, but my boss, you know, nine times out of ten, unless it goes against you know some moral or ethical value I have, I'm going to say yes no matter what. I'm I'm just complying. It makes life easier. Okay, a lot of you guys with your homework, a lot of you guys with your tests. When you go home to study, you don't want to. You don't want to have to do that, but you're complying with authority. Okay. Sometimes it's just easier. So take a look at the difference between conformity and compliance. Then you have obedience, um, following a direct order from another person. And we'll talk about this. The experiment is really, really interesting. How far would you go if an authority figure told you to do something? How far would you go? Okay, and this experiment really will shock you. I mean, literally, literally and figuratively, you're not going to get shocked. But that is a part of this experiment, and we'll go through all of it. Okay, there are a couple of effects on conformity um, that you guys will see socially. Does this page look familiar to you? Not the songs or anything. If you guys were to go to iTunes and this is when songs were 99 cents, what are songs now? Do you guys pay for individual songs? No. You guys, you guys still, what is it, pirating? Copyright? All right, so if you were to actually pay for songs, I used to do this when they were 99 cents. So if you guys can see the price over here, each song is 99 cents. Um, I, I, this is all Bob Dylan, a little Jason Mraz. Um, but what would conform you, or what would push you to buy the number one song on this page? How could numbers, what the effect on numbers? What on here would tell you, oh, must be good? Popularity. The popularity, right? You can see the popularity. Why put that up there? Why does it matter? The effect on numbers, number one. Okay, the number one song, oh, must be good. Might as well download it. And then they have a ranking of popularity. I, I mean, obviously it's the number one song. They, it's pretty popular, right? So this is the effect of numbers. You guys see this every day. You may not notice it or you may not, I don't know, internalize the fact that the reason you're buying a song, a book, a movie is because of its popularity, but it could be. Okay, so conformity has a huge effect on numbers. Effect of authority and of experts. Anybody watch the, what was the Academy Awards last night? Uh, Oscars. So there were six uh, movies that were put up for uh, best, what, best actor. There's um, uh, The Revenant. I, I saw The Martian the other day. The Martian was really good. I know I do this a lot with books. I will only read a book that somebody says, Miss Martin or Kristen, this was a great book. You need to read this. I will not just buy a book unless I know it's good. And that's the effect on authority and or experts. You guys go to your Kindle and you go to download a book, I don't just download it without reading other people's reviews. That's my money I'm spending on it. I'm not gonna spend money on a cr crummy book. <laughs> so crappy. All right, so winner of the 1961 National Book Award. It must be good. It won an award, right? So that's the effects of conformity. And then the other part, movies. Um, so with the Oscars last night, who won best uh, movie? Spotlight. Spotlight. That was the only one I, I had no idea about. But if, okay, so say The Martian won. I just saw it on Saturday. It was a really, really good movie. I liked it. Okay? But if it had won the award today and I hadn't seen it, well, I probably would check it out the next week. And that's where people get their money from. The effect of numbers and the effect of authority and or experts. Okay, does this, come, uh, does this ever affect you guys on a daily basis? I know it affects my reading mostly, not necessarily my movie watching. Anybody else? Jillian, you're nodding your head yes, why? Because I'm more likely to watch something. Right, if, if you know that it's good or it's gotten good reviews, right? I do a lot too on, do you guys shop on Amazon? Yeah, I'm like addicted, okay? I read reviews though, okay? I like Amazon Prime, it's, it's shipped directly to my house, but I will read a review thoroughly before I order anything. And people are pretty honest on those. All right, so this is the Solomon Ash, the Solomon Ash study that I was telling you about. I, we're gonna go over two studies. This is the first one. This one is really, really interesting. So I'll start with um, this. Basically he says, is the line in box A more similar to the first line, second line, or third line in box B? How many of you guys would say it's more similar to the first line in box A, or in box B, okay? 
You would say the first line? Yeah. Okay. Oh, congruent. Am I wrong? No, just hang on. So how many of you guys would vote line B is more accurate to line A? Okay. Dylan, do you think you're right or wrong now? I still think I'm right. Why do you think you're right? Because it's a similar, not, not the same. Okay. Maybe my vocab. So it was the same. Which one is the same? So then you would say B, right? But do you see where if you had said one answer and then all of your peers said something else where you might change your answer? Not in this specific instance because you, I misspoke. But do you see where you would change? Now what if I had talked to 60% of the people before you came in here and I said make sure to raise your hand for the first line. So 60% of the people raise it for number one knowing that they're wrong they were just trying to get you to conform to change your answer. So that's the basics, very basics of his study. So in groups of seven to nine college students, how many of you guys are taking psych right now? Okay, just curious. Seven to nine college students, a total of 18 trials. You guys can see how old this study is. It's very, I mean, relevant to today. A total of 18 trials were used. 12 out of 18, the wrong answer was given by the group. So he set up the wrong answer being given. On average, participants conformed to majority on approximately one-third of the trials. These were smart people. But that social influence and that pressure, there's a lot of different reasons why. I would feel completely and utterly embarrassed if I didn't just go along with everything else. I, I wouldn't be that type of person. Now, we will, we'll talk about some of the other things that can have effect your personality, your gender. Um, your personality is a big one. I wouldn't want to rock the boat. I wouldn't stand up and confront anybody, especially in a, an experiment setting where it's quiet, it's serious. You have a number in front of you? That's so serious. You're not going to be the one to go against and say, you guys are wrong. Or I'm sorry, I wouldn't be that person. Okay? About 25% remained independent. Dylan. 25% Dylan did. Okay, so this was the example of the stimuli that was used. And these were the results. 33% went along with the group went along with the group on a majority of the trials. 25% remained completely independent. 75% conformed at least one time. Okay, kind of shocking when you think about how easy of a question that was. I mean, regardless of what Dylan thought, 99% of you knew right away that it was B or that it was the second one. When tested alone, there were no Confederates, there were no other, people's, no other people there. The subjects that got more than 98% of the judgments uh, correct. So when they were tested in front of a group of people, when they were influenced by other people, is when they got 75% conformed at least once. When they were tested alone, 98% got it right on their own. And then when tested with Confederates, they only got 66% of the judgments correct. What, is those, what do those last two numbers tell you? Does social conformity have an influence? Yes, absolutely. Okay? Continuing to think in the back of your mind how this psychological lens can affect world history. Continue to think of that. We haven't touched on world history yet, and I really won't lecture on it, but that's how we're going to end our lecture. Continue to think about how this, cycle, this social um, conformity can lead into world history or current events. So why conform? Confusion. Maybe you didn't understand the question. Maybe you heard the question wrong. Maybe there was verbs, or maybe there was you know, a verbal miscommunication, okay? Um, informal or some type of informational pressure. Embarrassment, like I said, I wouldn't want to not be the one uh, to conform. And then compliance, okay? You're just following along. You're just going with the herd. All right, so then Ash, there was these two uh, quotes that I included. It says that we have found the tendency to conform in our society so strong that reasonably intelligent and well-meaning young people are willing to call white black as a matter is willing to call white black as a matter of concern. It raises questions about our ways of education and about the values that guide our conduct. And that you know, that was said in 1955. Like I said, the study is old but still very relevant. Um, confidence comes not from always being right, but from not fearing to be wrong. Right, Dylan? Good. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this part. There is a link that I have, a video, to explain this study a little bit more. It's not long.
Is there volume hooked up? I forget. Again, and its importance or influence on conformity. The experiment that we take part in today involves the conception of length of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to its length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, or fifth person with a white t shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Guys, so with the 
outfits and hairdos aside. Um, the video, the most important thing I took away from this video and what I heard is people will conform in order to not feel that sense of being wrong. How many of you guys have done that in your life? I don't need examples, but you've just gone along with something that's gone against your morals, your ethics, whatever, just because you didn't want to be the person that says, I don't think that that's right. That's a tough stance to take. Okay, and I know you guys are looking at conformity and all of these different viewpoints, but if you internalize the idea of conformity, that's probably the one that comes up the most. It's just going along with something because everybody else has. Okay, and I know it's that you know, fine line between a cliche and being true, but cliches are accurate because they happen a lot. Okay? Um, so with this study, keep this study in mind. And then the other one that we talked about, is, or we're going to talk about, is the Stanley Milgram. I like watching the video at the end. I know I put them at the beginning, but I like watching them at the end once you have some background information so you know what you're talking about or looking for. So with this experiment, it is the one that we talked about, obedience, obedience to authority. The basics of it, and I'm sure he'll correct me when I'm wrong, but um, you were hired by, say, pretend you were hired by somebody, um, and your boss continue to tell you, every time I tell you to do so, you're going to increase the shock value of, of this person. Okay? Because they, they did something wrong, and they said something wrong, and that's your job. You're getting paid to do this. So he has these people press the button that increases the shock value. Shock's not real. That's part of the experiment. Shock's not real. But you can hear the person crying out to, be, to stop. How many buttons do you push? How far do you go? Because you're just complying, or you're being obedient. Okay, and how far would, would these um, subjects go? So it says participants were brought into an experiment on learning through punishment. That's what they were under the, the pretense of. The participant is always the teacher. The confederate is always the learner. Okay, every time that the learner is wrong on a word recognition task, the teacher must administer a shock, with the shock increasing by 15 volts with each incorrect answer. So this is the start of the experiment. Again, this is Stanley Milgram. And you guys, will, if you take psych, IB psych, it's good to have a basis under, like a basic understanding of these two experiments because they become pretty important in both. All right, other variables and thoughts to consider. Milgram manipulated a number of different variables. I know when we talked about um, Solomon Ash, I didn't explain, like this wasn't the only picture given. You guys saw okay, the right answer everybody went along with, the right answer everybody went along, went along with. And then the wrong one was given, and that would have been really hard to go against because you guys were all right. You all had the same viewpoint for the first two, but that third picture, they all went against. So that's why it was a little different. I showed you an example, but there were more pictures given. So the distance between the learner and the teacher, and again, the learner um, is the, the confederate is always the learner, and the participant is always the teacher. What that means is the confederate is going along with the experiment. The confederate knows what's going on. Okay, and the teacher is the one pushing the buttons. So the distance between the learner and the teacher. If I can visibly see you and I can see you're in pain, I may not press as many buttons. If there's a wall between us and I can only hear you, I may press a few more, but not as many because I can still hear you. And if you're really far away in another room, maybe I just continue. Okay? Uh, well, depends on how much you pay me. The distance between the experimenter and the teacher, the location of the study, um, so these were all the things that were manipulated. And then whether the participant was the shocker or just an observer. Uh, foot in the door. Have you guys heard of foot in the door before? Have you, I'm sure you guys have done this. I have gone to my parents and I said, Mom, I, when I was younger, these new uh, basketball shoes, $140. Okay, and I asked for the one above. I don't really want those $140 ones, but there's $80 ones I really want. So I ask for the $140 ones, they say no, and then I say, well, how about just these 80 ones? And they're like, oh yeah, we can do that. I'm like, sweet, those are the ones I wanted. So you put a lot, like foot in the door, you get your foot in the door, but then you get what you want in return. So can I have $200? No, I'll take 100. That's what you're really going for anyway. So if you, then what I just taught you is to ask for something big, and then you'll get what you actually want. Um, because they feel good because they're saying no, but then you're still getting what you want. So that's foot in the door. And then fundamental attribution error we'll talk about too. All right, so with these other variables to consider, we're going to watch the video on Milgram. This one's a little bit longer, but I'll probably stop it in between. So the unique period from the 
early 60s to the early 70s, a group of Hi, guys. scientists conducted a series of experiments examining the nature of human behavior and its relationship to social conventions and situations. In this setting, I allow things to be done to me that I wouldn't allow in any other context. The dentist is about to put an electric drill into my mouth. In this setting, I willingly expose my throat to a man with a razor blade. Stanley Milgram, one of the most influential social psychologists of the time, was particularly fascinated with the dangers of group behavior and blind obedience to authority. What is there in human nature that allows an individual to act without any restraints whatsoever, so that he can act uh, inhumanely, harshly, severely, and in no way limited by feelings of compassion or conscience? These are quite... Well, he might be said in that experiment requires you. Ready on that 30 balls? The experiments that Milgram and others conducted were controversial. And for ethical reasons, may never be conducted again. Yet, the results of those experiments remain groundbreaking, profoundly revealing about the tensions between the individual and society, and increasingly relevant to contemporary life. In 1962, Stanley Milgram shocked the world with his study on obedience. <laughs> to test his theories, he invented a new that would become a window to human cruelty. In ascending order, a row of buttons marked the amount of voltage one person would inflict upon another. Milgram's original motive for the experiment was to understand the unthinkable how the German people could permit the extermination of the Jews. When I learned of incidents such as the massacre of millions of men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, how was it possible, I asked myself, that ordinary people who are courteous and decent in everyday life can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience? Now, there are some studies in my discipline, social psychology, that seem to provide a clue to this question. The problem I wanted to study was a little different, went a little bit further. It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? These are exactly the questions that I wanted to investigate at Yale University. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the Greater New Haven area. Psychologists have developed several theories to explain how people learn. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. Forty years later, Milgram's infamous experiment, Obedience, is still taught in the classrooms around the world. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which for you? All right, now the next thing we'll have to do is set the murder up so he can get some sort of punishment. Well, despite Milgram, I would say there are a number of factors. One of them is he was very ambitious. He wanted to make a mark in social psychology. And he wanted, as he wrote to one friend, he wanted to come up with the most, with the boldest experiment they could think of. When you roll up your right sleeve, please. This electrode is connected to the shock generator in the next room. And this electrode paste is to provide a good contact to avoid any blister of burn. Do you have any questions now before we go to the next room? About two years ago, I was in the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Mm -hmm. And while there, they detected a heart condition, nothing serious. But as long as I'm having these shocks, uh, how strong are they? How dangerous are they? Well, no, although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Anything else? No, that's all. All right, teacher, would you take the test and be seated in front of the shock generator, please? Mm -hmm. But the experiment was rigged. The victim was an accomplice of the experiment. The victim, according to plan, provided many wrong answers. His verbal responses were standardized on tape, and each protest was coordinated to a particular voltage level on the shock generator. Now, as a teacher, you were seated in front of this impressive-looking instrument, the shock generator. Its essential feature is a line of switches that goes from 15 volts to 450 volts, and a set of verbal designations that 
goes from slight shock to moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock, and finally XXX, danger severe shock. Your job, the experimenter explains to you, is a word pair test. If he gets each answer correctly fine, you move on to the next pair. But if he makes a mistake, you are instructed to give an electric shock, starting with 15 volts. And you increase the shock one step on each error. Incorrect. You'll now get a shock of 105. Hard hit. Just how far can you go in this thing? As far as it's necessary. Maybe as far as it's necessary. Milgram was very much aware that obedience is a necessary ingredient for society to function. But he focused on the darker side of obedience. And correct, 150 volts. Sad face. It's absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice. Oh, I have a lot of choices. My number one choice is that I wouldn't go on if I tell you to think hard. Now this line makes disobedience seem a very rational and simple deed. Now other subjects respond quite differently to the experimenter's authority. Wrong. Hair. 75 volts. It's just a reaction. He didn't know how to react. So he just started laughing. You guys ever like laughing? Like, yeah, I was laughing. experience. He's Laughing hysterically and appropriately. Clearly, you know, when we say people went to the top of their shop for it, it wasn't like they were going blithely sadistically, people went stop and go, stop and go. They were in a state of conflict, which was created a tremendous amount of stress. So that was the main critique. So we have 3.30. Three thirty. As his voice began to show increasing frustration, uh, so did I. And I was really in a state of uh, real conflict and agitation. One of Stanley Milgram's basic contributions was that you don't ask people what they would do given this hypothetical situation. You put them in the situation. That's a prerequisite for carrying out acts that are evil is to shed responsibility from your shoulders and, and hand it over to the person in charge. You know, we've got to take responsibility for anything that happens to that job. I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. Uh, next one, slow. He didn't hold any gun to anybody's head. Just the fact that he conveyed a sense of authority. Roughly 60, 65% of the people went all the way to the top of the shop board. Four and fifty bottles. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The four fifty switch for each wrong answer. Continue. I'm not getting no answer. Don't the man's help mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not. Well, he might be dead or that. Wilco made the point, I think, very effectively, that the Nazis were all a bunch of psychopaths at Nelson and Dachau at the death camp from the middle class in the day. Who's actually pushing the switch? I was. But he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said he's got to keep going. What kind of obedience would Milgram get today if he were to do the experiment today? Probably about the same. Probably about the same. Why? And uh, I think people are just inherently obedient. It just really shows like how far human beings will go to appease what they perceive to be as an authority figure. Milgram has identified one of the constants, one of the universals of social behavior, the readiness of the authority cuts across time. It's a constant. The other outstanding and distinctive thing about the obedience experiment is how much it has and keeps on permeating contemporary culture and thought. It's still with us in a very, very important way. Okay. Stanford Prison Experiment is another one. Um, 
if you're interested in this type of thing to look into. We're not going to get into the Stanford Prison Experiment. Both experiments, uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment as well as uh, Milgram's study, um, Obedience to Authority, are both unethical. So they wouldn't, I think you guys probably heard in the video today, they wouldn't redo these uh, because a lot of psychology now you have to go through ethics testing and neither one of these would pass. The Stanford Prism Experiment would not pass either. The lying one was fine, um, but lying to people about shocking other people isn't necessarily um, of ethical value. So um, you guys can see how this experiment is important to the idea of conformity and obedience. And it was a little disturbing to me. I guess I hadn't heard, I guess I hadn't looked at um, the, fin like the, the final study of it where it said like 60 to 70 percent of the people went all the way to the end. They argued throughout, but they ended up going all the way to the end. And one of the things they said in there was, you can't just ask people what they would do. You have to put them in that position. Like you got, we always say probably, oh, I don't know what I would do if I was ever put in that position. I mean, we say that on a daily basis or monthly basis. But that's what they were saying is you can't just ask people like what would your feelings be if you were to shock people because i had a ton of kids in class i uh was teaching this a little bit ago in my other class and um they were like oh yeah we would do it if somebody was giving us money i don't even think there was money promised here it was just an authority figure and you can see why and, and they explained why he milgram started um experimenting with obedience to authority it was it was hitler and that the basis of conformity, in my mind, through the lens of world history, starts with Hitler. I know there was um, historical conformity prior to Hitler. There was non-conformity. There was individual, individualism prior to Hitler. But the number one thing that comes to my mind, and I don't know if it came to yours when I asked you to think about conformity in world history, was Hitler. And so this was Milgram and basically saying, how could all of these people who worked for him do what they did? And that's what historically we want you guys to start thinking about. Now prior to um, Hitler, when I was thinking about nonconformists, um, some of our great historical, positive, influential people were nonconformists. Think of it. Who, who would be considered a nonconformist? Somebody we were just studying, Derek? FDR. Why FDR? What did he do? Um, he was against Hitler. He wanted, you know, Hitler and Japan, you know, is gone because they were promoting evil on Okay, and a lot of his um, programs after were nonconformist, were not of nonconformity. Who else? And I know in my class I was just teaching about the Protestant Reformation, the Renaissance, and the Scientific Revolution, and the Enlightenment. How could any of those people be considered nonconformist? They all took their own approach, and before it, everything was based around faith, but they took the leap and they're like, no, we're not just believing everything the church says blindly. We're going to look at actual reasoning and look by what scientific observations they just did. Awesome. That's exactly it, Ryan. Well, those scientists also were scared of uh, their, like, to publish their findings. They wait for them to their lives. So. Yeah, a lot of them were scared to publish their findings, right? And we talked about Copernicus specifically and his struggles. Uh, what was Copernicus's struggles? Kayla, didn't you have Copernicus? Didn't your group have Copernicus? Go ahead. I was going to say Copernicus was the one who came up with the geocentric, or the heliocentric Helios. model Good. of the solar system, where, which is where the sun is at the center of the solar system, which was the unpopular belief at the time where they thought that the Earth was the center of the geocentric model. Good. So the church was pushing the geocentric mo model, and then you have Copernicus. He was so afraid to verbalize his thoughts because it was so against the grain. So he was the first one to think of it. He may not have proved it. He kind of lit the torch and everybody ran with it. Um, but at the same time, he really struggled because he still had his faith in the church. And you could see where that uh, back and forth belief would come where I believe in the church, but they're kind of saying the wrong thing right now. And then that taking into account everything there, and then the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther being one of the biggest nonconformists and going against directly what the Catholic Church had said. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself and giving you guys some tips toward, towards the end, but um, we'll finish this. Some fads, so we're talking about fads and conformity in action and what, it, what you guys can see. Some of these probably don't even look familiar to you, but uh, this is John Travolta, he was an actor. This is a lava lamp, you guys ever seen a lava lamp? These were all fads coming through. That's all conformity. If you guys look around, I mean, back then, I used to take a brush, hold my bangs up, and stand there with the hairspray. 
everybody else was doing it. And I thought I was going to get in trouble for using the curling iron, and my brother told on me for using the curling iron. And my mom just said, it's okay as long as you turn it off, which makes sense. I don't know. But I used to curl my bangs just sideways so that they could, like, and I would just, then I would just spray them. That's conformity. Did you guys ever go through your phase of, I, when I taught at Brandon for five years, so it was probably about four years ago, they had these big, like, bumpets in their hair. Like, always had big hair. Okay, big hair was a big thing, what, in the 60s, 70s? Those are all, that's all conforming. Okay, a lot of you guys look really nice. Maybe in 20 years you look back and you said, did I really wear that? Okay, um, so these are all fads that took place. Uh, diets, all diets are fads. The only thing that works is working out and eating healthy. Um, I, don't, I don't really know that, why I put that telephone picture in there. Um, dances, the limbo, 3D movies. Now how many of you guys have 3D TVs? Remember it was a fad to see how many people could fit into a telephone movie? Is that what that was? That was a fad? Is that you right there? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the hula hoop. Some of these things are still around and they kind of stand the test of time, but. Uh, streaking, like running through a football game or whatever. It's dumb. <laughs> Having a pet rock, they used to sell those. Um, what are some of your fads? Silly bands, those went gone, right? They were banned from some schools. Did you guys ever have the, um, okay, did you guys ever have the, the bracelets where they like slapped around your wrist? Those were banned from elementary school when I was there. Skinny jeans. Skinny jeans on guys and girls. All right, um, conformity in action, we talked briefly. Guys, I only have 10 minutes. We talked briefly about, you know, some fashion, some architecture. World history, this is what I want you guys to focus on. Okay, how does conformity fit into world history? You guys are gonna split up into the people that are around you. Just get in a group of four to five, okay? I see some people have paper, some people don't. If you can hand out paper. What I want you guys to do is you're gonna get into your small groups. You're gonna talk about some historical events that have influenced conformity, not Hitler. I'm taking Hitler off the table. Okay, that was the number one everybody wants to talk about. And we will, just not yet. Okay, in your groups, these are the five things I want you to kind of jot down so I can, you have free reign, but I want to kind of guide your free reign. Talk about the historical event that you came up with. Talk about all of these different ones and pick one, not non-conformity, but conformity. Um, it's linked to conformity. Obviously, if I'm using Hitler as the example, um, conformity are all of the, the German soldiers. Um, and you guys saw the, the vivid pictures. I probably should have warned you, but... Um, your predictions, this is the most important part to me because I think this is very interesting. How could the world be different? I mean, there were 42 assassination attempts that we know of on Hitler. How would the world have been different if, first of all, Hitler had died, or second, like, in the middle of it, or second of all, if people hadn't conformed as easily as they did? How did he get people to conform? Okay, Hitler specifically, He's, his lectures, his speeches, were two to three, four hours long. All he did was rally his troops. The propaganda, their media coverage, okay? If all of your neighbors are German Nazi soldiers and you're the only one who's not, okay? So think about it in the, in the aspect of social conformity too. How would that have been different? What would the outcome have been? Current, I want you guys to think of current event issues that are related to conformity. I automatically think of, of the presidential race right now in politics and how you specifically are influenced by all of the different amazingly wonderful presidential candidates that we have right now. And then the media's influence. Guys, this is the most um, specific to you. The media's influence on conformity in major world events. We don't have much time, but I want you guys to get together and kind of chat real quick. Let's chat. <laughs>
to walk you through the debrief on this. Okay, so you guys tomorrow are going to talk about in your group which historical event you picked. Um, it's linked to conformity, your prediction. Hold on, I'm not done yet. Your links to conformity and the media's influence. So that's my class. You, Mr. Isaac's class will debrief on this tomorrow as well. My class, the last thing, is your questions that you got Tuesday, Wednesday. They, you need them done by tomorrow. Mr. Compton is going over them in class with you. Chapter 25 questions. Mr. Isley.